Uh, so I guess everything I'm going to talk about is, is this readable from the back? <coughs> no. Uh, it's all in the literature, more or less. Uh, but you know, here's a, a list of references that I looked at when preparing this talk. So I guess if the PDFs are going online, people can look at that. I mean, the, of course, the, most of it comes from the, the first reference, uh, Thurston's Notes, which also maybe it's important to know are still available online at MSRI. Um, and then there are several, uh, the other papers are, and textbooks are, uh, you know, expansions of what Thurston wrote and additions to it. Uh, but the slogan, uh, the volume is a topological invariant of hyperbolic free manifolds, uh, I guess is you know, sort of a theme of uh, Dave Cooter's talk as well, um, although he turned the crank on the black box to see this, and I think most people do actually, quote lost our virginity for why that's the case. Uh, I sort of decided, preparing this talk, that maybe that's not actually the best philosophical point of view, but uh, we'll see. Anyway, uh, this is maybe a better place to start, is with uh, Gromov's invariant. Uh, so Gromov defines an invariant of space, uh, uh, I guess for manifolds, uh, what you should do is take the fundamental class of the manifold, think of it as a singular homology class, so it will be represented by various singular chains. And for those chains, you take the L1 norm of the coefficients, some of the absolute values of the coefficients, and then take the infimum over all possible chains representing the class. Kind of a strange uh, definition, maybe, and it's not a norm, even though it looks like it, because you could certainly have situations where the norms are tending to zero for different chains representing the same class, but it's a semi norm. And uh, so he defines the norm of a manifold to be the value of this when you use the fundamental class of the manifold. So, uh, I guess there's no reason to expect there's anything interesting here. You might very well just get zero all the time. And it's pretty easy to give examples where you will get zero. For example, a torus, I think it's pretty clear because if you take a huge covering space of the torus and you represent its fundamental class, let's say, with two triangles, and then you project that down into the covering, you're representing some huge multiple of the fundamental class downstairs. So you could have divided by that huge multiple first place and you get something arbitrarily small. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be a covering map for that argument to work either. You could take, for example, a branch covering of the two-sphere by itself many times and you're going to get zero for this as well. But uh, I guess it is clear that it's a topological invariant. It doesn't have anything to do with geometry uh, a priori. And it has kind of natural properties silly if it's always zero, but they, the norm is always going to go down under a mapping because you're going to be taking the int over a larger set. And in fact, if you're looking at orientable manifolds and applying this to the, to the fundamental class, then you can always actually divide by the degree and you can still have the inequality holding. So it, it behaves naturally. And, you know, the amazing thing was that Gromov was able to prove this theorem. Question? Do you need to read the book for the No. Just in any, I mean, you're, you're covering the fundamental class that many times, so you can always divide by that. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> that should be a D. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, OK, so the amazing fact is that for hyperbolic manifolds, uh, this is geometric somehow. The norm of the manifold is actually equal to the volume of the manifold divided by this magic number B3, which is, I guess we'll learn to compute this afternoon, but it's the volume of a regular ideal Hecklerian <coughs> space. Well, this is actually a, a 
n dimensional sort. We'll see. But anyway, um, so I, I want to talk about the proof of that first. Uh, so that's a situation where you have something which is clearly topological in nature, and according to this amazing result, somehow measures geometric things, and proves that volume, the, the theorem already without the Moscow uh, black box shows that volume is a topological invariant or hyperbolic one. <coughs> okay, so this proof, which comes out of Thurston's notes, yeah, question? There is a proof that doesn't use Moscow? Um, of that well, I, I'll try to give you one, yeah. Okay. In fact, it'll, it goes the other way. It implies Mostet. So, I mean, the, the, the proof in Thurston's notes uh, starts with Gromov's theorem and deduces Mostet for from it. So I think that's kind of the, the philosophical twist. Maybe uh, this Gromov norm point of view is <coughs> something even more fundamental or lower level than the rigidity. Uh, okay, so um, in, in Thurston's notes, he gives a different definition of the Gromov norm, which uh, is maybe uh, slightly scary at first, although I think it shouldn't really be. Uh, but it, it required him to invent a new homology theory to prove this theorem. Uh, so it's, it's called measure homology. So here's the definition. Uh, a measure K chain is a compactly supported signed Morel measure with bounded total variation. And it's a measure on the space of all maps, C1 maps, of the simplex into the manifold. That sounds pretty frightening, but maybe the first thing to notice is that an ordinary singular chain where you just have a finite number of singular simplexes, uh, well, that's just a special case where you put a, a Dirac mass on each simplex. So it's, it is an example of a measure. And maybe this shouldn't be that, you know, it's not that much worse than something like uh, taking a multi-curve on the <laughs> surface and thinking of it as a special case of a measured lamination where you just are putting masses concentrated on the components instead of on the, you know, spreading it out over the leaves of the lamination. So I think we don't have to be terrified yet. And uh, it turns out to have some amazing properties. Um, so what's the homology theory? Well, the chains then are these measures instead of being Finite sums of simplices, they're somehow measures on the space of simplices. Question? What is bounded total variation? Uh, well, I'm going to define it in a second, but the total variation of a measure is the largest number that you can get by integrating a function bounded by one. Or sometimes you could you can decompose the measure into a positive part and a negative part and add up the total masses of the two parts. We have to use signs, you know, because you can't really do algebraic topology without having some, without allowing negative coefficients on the simplexes. So you can think of it as total mass, but it's important that we're using signs. Yeah? So in order to give the space, so we should keep the measure in the individual? Well, yeah. Uh, but, you know, this group of, the group of, Ordinary singular chains is pretty infinite dimensional too. And somehow we survived that <laughs> to break ecology. So, uh, yeah, so I guess we live with that. Uh, okay, well, you know, you need a boundary map for this to work. So uh, the reason I'm using slides is I didn't trust myself to get all my upper stars on the top and lower stars on the bottom and get them in the right place, but I hope I did it here. So if we think about including a face into a simplex, that's a standard simplex. The delta sub k's will be standard affine simplexes that we're mapping in. Uh, then you get uh, an induced map. Uh, yes? 
going the other way, <laughs> from k chains to k minus 1 chains. And then if I take a measure, measures push forward. So I push the measure forward, and I call that the ith face map, and then I take the alternating sum of those. And it gives you a chain complex. Question? Yeah. Oh. I'm sorry. No, I screwed that up. Uh, that, uh, I meant for the C upper one to mean C1 maps, and I meant to put lower ones on my chains. So, oh, I did that. That's correct. Yeah. So this is all, we're looking at all, no, they're not co-chains. They're just singular simplexes. So C upper one means C1 maps from the simplex into the space. Well, what is the difference? Is that C1 and that uh, Yeah, because we want to integrate over these things. That's the only reason we want that. Yeah, so is that your question? Yeah, so just C1 differentiable maps. So it's a function space, it's not a vector space. Yeah, so it's a topological space. Right. Not a vector space. It's not the, those are not the one co-chains. Right. <laughs> it's just the set of all the simplexes. <coughs> uh, I don't know what, well, I guess you could recognize it because it has a common. Sums, some finite, I mean, so an ordinary points, singular chain would be a finite sum of such things. A finite sum of points in that space with weights would be a singular chain. And I'm, instead of looking at finite sums of those points, I'm taking measures from that space. But to talk about measures, don't you mean a sigma algebra? I mean, well, it's a Borel measure, so you'll have the sigma algebra should be generated by the open sets. You have a sigma in case of the point to compact open to Okay. okay. Well, uh, and here's the definition of the total variation then of a measure chain, which is the total variation of the measure. The measure chain is just a measure. Uh, so you take the maximum integral that you would get for a function bounded by one. And it corresponds in, in the Dirac mass. If you had a finite sum of Dirac measures <coughs> with weights, then you would be adding up the absolute values of the coefficients. So it specializes to Gromov's definition, but it's general. And so you can define the semi norm this way. Uh, you know, so Thurston's notes uh, gives this proof that I'm going to give. And then the, the paper by Munkholm, actually, that I put on the reference, is a kind of an expanded discussion of more or less the same argument. And it's kind of, there are a couple of interesting points historically about this. But uh, one thing about Munkholm's paper is that uh, there's a statement in there that this measure homology is isomorphic to the singular homology, and it's underlined. And in Thurston's notes, there's a statement that the measure homology is isomorphic to the singular homology. It's not underlined, it's just stated there. But uh, people have been, oh, I, I meant to mention that we obviously have the same inequalities holding. Uh, so people have been thinking about this since. Uh, and in fact, there's a, I discovered, searching the internet, preparing this talk, a recent paper by uh, Clara Lu in 2006. And uh, she actually shows that uh, these two homology theories, the ordinary singular one and the measure homology, are isomorphic in this strong sense that the isomorphism between the homology groups preserves this norm. So really, you're free to work with either one, as Thurston said. And uh, you, know, you have a lot of formal properties that come automatically once you know that they're isomorphic. Uh, so OK, so if I identify the two fundamental classes in these two theories, by this isomorphism, uh, then I can define the norm using either definition. I'm going to get the same thing. So the measured version was Thurston's definition. And um, once you know that, I guess you also have this stronger formal property about the degree, because the two 
fundamental classes are really the same. Uh, okay, so uh, we need to be able to deal with these strange chains somehow, and uh, the key is to be able to integrate K forms over these measure chains. That turns out not to be too hard to do. Uh, the, the ordinary notion of integrating a K form over a singular K chain just extends nicely, and this is the formula for it. So the measure chain I'm calling mu because that's what it is, it's a measure. Uh, and I take a K form omega on the manifold, and I would like to produce a number, so I would like to have a function that I could integrate against this measure, get a number coming out. And there's a natural function to look at, which is for each singular chain, you integrate this form over it, and that gives you a number, so that's a function on this space where we have a measure, and then we integrate that measure. So that's uh, very natural, I guess. And, you know, the, the fact that these theories are isomorphic in a strong way gives us lots of nice extra features. So, uh, how do you tell if two measure of K cycles represent the same homology class? Well, if you get the same answer when you integrate forms over them, then they're going to be the same class. So, for example, that t lets you know uh, if you take well, you, you, you can figure out whether a, a measure chain represents the fundamental class of a manifold by integrating it over the manifold. Uh, and, uh, well, that's what I'm saying here. I mean, if I have a Riemannian n-manifold, and I take a measure n-cycle, then if I integrate that measure cycle, um, I mean, if I look at the, if I integrate the measure cycle over the manifold, I get some value. If it were the fundamental class, the value that I would get would be the volume of the manifold. So this is saying that the class which is represented by the n cycle is a multiple of the fundamental class, which is whatever you get when you pair it with the volume form divided by the volume of the manifold. And if it were the fundamental class, integrating over the manifold would give you volume and those would cancel out if you want. Okay, so uh, you can't really control the values of that function I was talking about so well in general. I mean, this is <coughs> where it's going to be advantageous to have these measure chains, I think, that give you more control than the ordinary ones in some sense. But so, you know, a simplex mapping into hyperbolic space, for example, could be arbitrarily large. Uh, but we do have geometry to use here, so I want to, the next step is this uh, operation called straightening. So I'm going to be working with a hyperbolic manifold and thinking of it as H n mod gamma, and I have uh, the universal covering projection down. Okay, so now take a singular simplex in hyperbolic space. Well, it's, it's the map of a standard simplex into hyperbolic space. There's some vertices in hyperbolic space. And I could take the convex hull of those vertices, and that would be a hyperbolic simplex. And so there's uh, this canonical map, which takes an arbitrary simplex and replaces it by the convex hull of the vertices of the image straightening it out. Uh, you really should do it in a more careful way than that, though, because the singular simplex is supposed to be a map. So there's also a completely canonical way to map a standard simplex into a geometric simplex, because in hyperbolic space, you have barycentric coordinates, just like in Euclidean space. And so you can map points with certain barycentric coordinates to the point with the same barycentric. So the straightening map takes any simplex and replaces it by this completely standard map from standard simplex in hyperbolic space, which preserves the bare central coordinate. And it's, it's homotopic to the original simplex. So if I have a chain, and it's, it's canonical, so if I have a chain, for example, with, which, is a, which has 
boundary zero and I straighten everything out, it's still going to have boundary zero. Cancellations will persist. Uh, okay, so um, we need, really need to define It may this. not preserve the dimension. Sorry? It may not preserve the dimension. Uh, well, that's true. But it's still, a, there's still a standard map, right? You, you can let some barycentric coordinates be generated. Um, okay, so um, if I have a simplex in the manifold instead of an hyperbolic space, then the straightening operation is you lift the simplex to a map into hyperbolic space, you straighten it out, and you project it back down into the manifold. So if I, if I want, I guess I could um, sort of restrict the space where these measures that we're looking at live. You could look at measures which are only supported on these special straight simplexes, if you like. So that's like a sub complex of the full measure complex, which is restricting the support of the measures. Uh, and that inclusion, uh, so that you have an inclusion from the straight measure chains to the general measure chains, but you also have this straightening map going back the other way. And those are, that gives you a, a chain equivalence, and so you can compute homology with either of those complexes. Okay, so uh, the, the straightening is enough to get the, the easy direction of Chromos you know, one inequality. Um, so it does depend on a geometrical fact coming later this afternoon, I guess. <laughs> uh, once we have a formula for the volume of an ideal hyperbolic tetrahedron, one should check that the regular one is the largest. Do that. Um, actually, at the at the time that Thurston's notes were written, there wasn't a formula known in. Well, it wasn't known that the regular hyperbolic simplex was the simplex of maximal volume in higher dimensions. But that's what uh, Munkholm proved. So I guess that allows us to do n dimensions if we like. Discusses that you, I mean, you, yeah, he has a whole discussion about it in his notes, which I can't go into. Um, all right, so uh, I'm trying to prove the easy direction of Gromov's theorem here. So this is just this calculation that's on the screen. So take a measure chain, may as well assume that it's straight. So all of the it's supported only on the straight simplexes. And suppose it represents the fundamental class of the manifold. Well, that's the fundamental class either way you think about it. So you know that when you pair it with the volume form, you're supposed to get the volume of the manifold. And so I can compute the volume of the manifold as, the, as what you get when you integrate the volume form against this measure chain. But um, since I'm only looking at straight simplexes here, I'm actually just calculating the volume of some hyperbolic simplex when I compute the value of this function at every point. So it's bounded above by the maximal volume, which is the volume of the regular simplex. So you get this inequality that the volume of the manifold is less than or equal to the Gromov norm times the volume of the largest simplex. So that's that's the easy half. Uh, the hard half is, uh, is an amazing idea, in my opinion. <laughs> so the advantage of having these more, these fancier chains is that uh, there are uh, constructions of interesting cycles that are completely different from what you would think of normally. I don't know, what, what does a singular chain look like anyway? I mean, <laughs> I think people usually think of them as they pretend that you actually have a triangulation of the manifold and then a singular chain is just a singular simplex. So I don't think anybody really has any good picture of a true 
singular chain, but they're certainly a lot worse than that, and they're going to cancel out with each other and go all over the place. It'd be a huge mess. Uh, so anyway, there, there's a, another, there's a construction of a chain, uh, well, and a cycle, which uh, Thurston called smearing, maybe you'll see why. Uh, so the, the point is that the isometries of hyperbolic space actually act on the chains, the singular chains in the manifold. Namely, you take a singular chain, well, just take a simplex. So you have a singular simplex, map of a K simplex into the manifold, lift it to hyperbolic space, act by an isometry, project it back down. And that gives you a new singular simplex. So um, you can you know, think about all these singular chains dividing up into orbits under this action. Of course, if you, if you translate it by something which is in the group gamma and project it back down, it's going to be the same again. So the orbit is really just this quotient uh, isometry group mod gamma, which is a fairly tame space, an SO3 bundle over the manifold. So, okay, so now to describe this construction, I'm going to give you a measure on this set of. Why is it not pin? Oh, sorry? Can you say it from baseball? Why is it not M? Why? Uh, sorry. Tell me where. What's the. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, there are some people that should be M. Uh, well, the. No, I'm sorry. It's, it's like all of the. You have the stabilizer of a point sitting as a fiber over a point in the manifold. So I take all isometries. I'm not taking hyperbolic space dividing by gamma. I'm taking all the isometries of hyperbolic space divided by gamma. So the isometries, you have a whole rotation group sitting above each point. And then I divide by gamma. Yeah, so I, I think it comes out to an SO3 bundle over gamma. Uh, OK, so uh, we want to, one of these, so this smearing construction is going to be a measure which is supported on one of these orbits. And we have to choose the measure, normalize it correctly. So uh, the way to do it is to make it be a local product measure. So it should look like the ordinary volume measure on the manifold direction and a car measure on the SO3 direction normalized to have volume one. So that, that gives me a specific measure supported on this one orbit. Sir, it looks like you specialized into three at some point. Well, actually, it went the other way. <laughs> I started out with three, and then I went back and changed it, the threes to ends. Looks like I missed one, though. Uh, yeah, so I mean, everything. <laughs> Sorry, if, if you see threes here, they're supposed to be ends. didn't use the right search in your place. <laughs> uh, OK. So what does this mean? Well, we want to compute the total variation of this smear of a simplex. So the smear of a simplex is you start with a standard simplex, and then you look at its orbit, and then you put this uniform metric on the orbit. So to find the norm of it, you take the total mass of that. It's a positive measure. Take the total mass of that. And the way we set this up, it integrates to be the volume of M, because the fiber direction is at mass 1. Uh, I mean, I, I could have taken a negative simplex as well, negatively oriented simplex. These are always oriented manifolds. And then I would get minus the volume when I did the integral, but the norm would still be the volume. OK, so here's the, the tricky direction of this Wilmot theorem. Uh, so don't start with, you can do that smearing for any simplex you like, but start with an actual straight simplex and smear that. So uh, its image, the image of the simplex is a nice geometrical hyperbolic simplex, has a certain volume. 
So if we do this construction and then pair the measure against the volume form, uh, it should come out like this. We integrate against the measure function, which is the volume of the image simplex. And so we're just going to get the volume of that simplex times the volume of the manifold. So, of course, who cares? I mean, this is just a chain. You can't do homology with chains. You have to have cycles. And so the amazing part is <laughs> that you can you construct a cycle out of this by the following construction. We take one standard simplex sitting in hyperbolic space and sphere it. And we get this chain which pairs against the volume form to give us the volume of the manifold. But now you take that simplex and reflect it through one of its sides. So if you think about doing that, well, one of the sides of the reflected simplex is the same as the original one. And the other side, so let's say we're in dimension three for a minute, so the other three sides, you can just rotate each one around its edge to give you a face of the other simplex. So up to the action of the isometry group, the faces of those <coughs> simplex and its reflection are the same. So if you are allowed to do this smearing operation and just sum over all possible isometries, everything cancels out and you actually get something with boundary zero. So that's the, uh, you know, I think, pretty amazing idea. So while well, you don't get a chain here, if you uh, just add the smear of the simplex with the smear of its reflection, suddenly it does become a chain. And the, the uh, so you get a, sorry, it becomes a cycle. And the orbits of those two simplexes are just joined from each other. So when you pair against the volume form, you're just getting the sum of what you would have got for the two of them. So you get two times the volume of the manifold when you integrate this cycle. Uh, OK, so uh, in other words, the, the class that's represented by this smear cycle is going to be the fundamental class multiplied by some number, which is two times the volume of the simplex that you started out. Well, there is no corresponding simplicial cycle. That's the beautiful thing. <laughs> it's a completely new way to construct the fundamental class of the manifold. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that I can't imagine what it would correspond to in the traditional point of view. Yeah. So say again what the cycle is. Well, the cycle is I take a simplex and I smear it. So in other words, I turn that simplex into a measure. The measure is this uniformly distributed, nice measure supported on the orbit of that simplex under all hyperbolic isometry. Now I take another simplex, which is the reflection of the first one, and I smear that, and I add them together. Uh, oh, maybe I should have subtracted them. Uh -oh. <laughs> I should have subtracted them. Sorry. I subtract them. <laughs> because they have I, the exact same faces up to the action of the isometry. So I just, I'm just i subtracting off the boundary when I do that. Their, you know, different isometries are pairing up the faces of one smear and the other. So when you do a smear, you're looking at orbit. Yeah, it's a measure supported on an orbit. And then when I take the the faces, I'm looking at measures supported on orbits of the faces. But the the, the orbits of the faces are the same. And so I, when I subtract, I don't get any value. <laughs> What if you started with a triangulation with geodesic sides for the simplices, and then you did this operation for a single simplex with geodesic? Well, these I am doing it with a straight simplex. Oh, you are. Um, yeah, because otherwise, when I pair it with the volume form, I have to. I mean, you could do it with any simplex you like, but it's going to be harder to understand if it's not straight because you're going to be looking at the 
value of some singular syntax. So we will be able to compare that to the value of the ideal regular syntax. But no, I mean this, yeah, it works fine for, for any syntax, but for this argument, you need a straight one. If you subtract, why don't you get one? Because uh, the, it's the absolute value when you take the total variation, you take the, you integrate, the, it's the total mass. If you, if you multiply a measure by minus one, you don't change its total variation. You change its total mass. You're taking the absolute value. Yeah. Is there a way to say it by considering M connected sound uh, and bar or inclusion reverse? I don't, but you know, I don't think, I don't think you can escape. I mean, you can, there's another argument, but you're not going to get this beautiful Thurston argument unless you allow him to do this beautiful construction of a fundamental cycle. Yeah. To go back to the infinite dimensional question, so here the steering only takes you in the planet dimensional. Yeah, the support of the measure is just on this nice map. It's just, there's a copy of this bundle over the three manifolds sitting inside the space of simplexes. And the measures just support it on that. And all I care about is its total mass, or its total variation, or what happens when I integrate it against M form. And so all the other stuff doesn't really affect it. Uh, so the end of the story is that the norm of the manifold is less than or equal to norm of this smear cycle divided by two times the volume of the simplex that you used for the cycle in the first place. But um, well, that's supposed to be two. Well, it, yeah, the twos cancel out. The norm of sigma is two times the volume. Uh, so you start out with some simplex, and what you get for the uh, norm an estimate of the norm is uh, volume of the manifold divided by the volume of the simplex you started out with. But then you could take the simplexes arbitrarily close to a regular ideal simplex. And in the limit, you're getting that the volume of M is greater than the, or equal to the norm of the manifold times the maximum volume simplex. Can you say that by the norm of M is less than the norm of sigma divided by? Well, I did this. I did this computation with sigma by pairing it with the volume form. And what I got was 2 times the volume of my starting simplex uh, times the volume of the manifold. If I took the fundamental class and did that, I would have got just the volume of the manifold. So since this, we checked, this cycle is uh, I mean, that this checks that the cycle represents 2 V sigma times the fundamental class. So if I want to take the uh, norm of the manifold, I'm supposed to work with different chains that represent the fundamental class. So to transform this into something which represents the fundamental class, I would divide it by 2 times the volume of my starting simplex. And then when I do that, I have to then take the nth over all possible uh, chains that represent the fundamental class. And just in this family, I have chains which go down to uh, volume of M divided by the volume of the maximal simplex. So I get the inequality. The norm of the fundamental class is represented by a bunch of chains which individually have uh, norm which is <coughs> m over v sigma and in the in the over the whole family the nth is going to be volume of m over vm. Yeah. So the fact that the, when you pair sigma with dv it doesn't cancel is it the reduction? Well the when you pair sigma uh, no. No the reason it doesn't cancel is because you're taking total variation. So you have a negative, you have a negative measure and a positive measure, but the total variation is the sum of the two masses. Uh, 
No, no, the thing is I'm taking, uh, in both cases, I'm taking, uh, What was the question? No, no, I, there's the a question? sign problem. You want to uh, smear when I, when by I the sphere. I reflected the simplex. You want to smear by the sphere. Negatively oriented. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, I should have, when I do the interval, I'm going to get minus the volume, and then when I subtract, I get two times the volume. Yeah. Sorry. I knew it wasn't going to, doing the slides wasn't going to completely solve this. Um, yeah, so anyway, that, that's right. The reflection would be negatively oriented, but then I subtract, so I end up with summing. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, I think that proves Hormos theorem. Corb is equal to the volume. Uh, so the reason Gromov proved the theorem was to give this simple proof of Moscow rigidity. So I thought I'd go through that. So uh, I'm now. So here's the statement of the Moscow rigidity theorem. This is for closed manifolds. So I have two closed manifolds, hyperbolic, dimension bigger than two, uh, and they're homotopy equivalent. I want to prove that the groups are conjugate in the isometry group, and therefore the manifolds are isometric. So here are the steps. Uh, I take a homotopy equivalence to begin with. And, okay, I want to make a definition here. So, uh, if I have n plus one points sitting on the sphere at infinity, I want to call those a regular n plus one tuple if they span a regular ideal simplex. Uh, so, here are the steps. First of all, you lift the homotopy equivalence to hyperbolic space and prove that it's a quasi-isometry, which was a term that hadn't been invented in the time that the notes were written, but uh, now is used all the time, and argue that you can extend this lift continuously to a map of the sphere of infinity. So I'm going to skip that step because that seems to be something that everybody accepts these days as easy to do, geometric group theory and so on, and we don't have time anyway. Uh, so that's step one. Step two, uh, prove that the map on the sphere of infinity takes a regular n plus one tuple to a regular n plus one tuple. And step three, prove that that implies that it's actually an isometry. Okay, so here's step two. Uh, suppose you had, suppose you, you want to get a contradiction. So suppose you had this <laughs> map on the sphere of infinity and it took a nice regular simplex to some other ideal simplex which was not regular. So it's going to have strictly smaller volume. <coughs> and I want to uh, approximate, I'm only allowed to work with true simplexes, not ideal simplexes here. So let's take some straight non-ideal simplexes which are converging to this uh, regular simplex that's going to be distorted under the map. And do this construction with the smear, except use the minus sign, it's the plus sign. Uh, so I do the, the smearing for each simplex in this sequence. And no matter which simplex in the sequence I use, the, the smearing construction gives me a cycle that's representing the fundamental class of the manifold uh, up to a multiple. So in fact, what it, according to our formula, what it is is the, uh, the volume of the image simplex divided by the maximal volume times the fundamental class. So what's happening as the, uh, sorry, it's, it's the volume, it's the volume of the simplex divided by the maximal volume. So in the limit, these chains are 
converging to the fundamental class. And now I can push them forward under the, the homotopy equivalence followed by straightening map. And both of those don't do anything on homology, so I still get a sequence of things which are converging to the fundamental class. But if I look at this irregular simplex, there's a whole open set of isometries that move it around, move its vertices around, or move it around. Uh, and if I look at the images of those under the, the lifted homotopy equivalence, they're all going to have volume which is noticeably less than the maximal volume. They're all going to be close to irregular ideal simplexes of the same shape. So when you pair the pushed forward thing, so you take the smear of these things, you push it forward, and you straighten it, and pair that with the volume form, you get two contributions to the measure. Uh, one is on a set of positive measure, you have some definite deficiency from the volume of the maximal simplex. And then you have everything else, which you don't know anything about, it might be as large as the maximal simplex. But uh, what you're getting is strictly less than the volume of the maximal simplex. But we know the volumes of the manifolds are the same by Gromov's theorem. And so we get a contradiction because the pushed forward thing paired with the volume form should be giving us strictly less than uh, the dn times the volume of the manifold. And it's not, because they're representing the fundamental class and the limit. We're supposed to be getting the fundamental class to give us the volume when we care. OK, so. Here's step three. OK, so um, what we proved so far is that a regular n plus 1 tuple of points goes to a regular n plus 1 tuple of points under the map on the sphere at infinity. So we want to argue that that means that this map on the sphere at infinity is actually a Mobius transformation. Uh, once we know that, we're done because you know the action on the sphere at infinity determines the action on hyperbolic space, and so if we can conjugate the two actions on the boundary by Mobius transformation, then we can conjugate them also by isometries. Isometry group. Okay, so here's the construction. You take a regular ideal simplex in hyperbolic n space, and just think about the reflection group that it generates reflecting through the sides of that simplex. So you reflect it through one, through all, let's say you're in three dimensions, so you reflect it through the four sides, and then you continue reflecting like that. And what you end up with is a tessellation of hyperbolic space by a regular ideal tetrahedra. And the vertices of that thing are dense on the sphere at infinity. And regular n tuple, n plus one tuples, go to regular n plus one tuples. So the tessellation goes to the tessellation. And so that means that it's uh, actually, I mean, there's an isometry that takes the tessellation to the tessellation the same way. So this map has to be a Mobius transformation. OK. Ready for the quiz? <laughs> oh, you're not ready for the quiz yet. OK. Oh, why n greater than 2? That's the quiz. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There it is. Where did we use n greater than 2? So this is the key, right? This is why 3 dimensions is rigid and 2 dimensions is not, is somehow buried in this place where we use the n was greater than 2. You use it before it has to have the regular triangle. Well, no, that's actually, it's actually true in the plane as well. The regular ideal triangle has maximal volume. <laughs> but it's not unique. So when we reflected 
this thing through a face, that's a that's a canonical operation, but uh, there's no reason, there's no guarantee that the isometry would give us the same simplex unless there was a unique way to reflect the simplex through a face, which there is in higher dimensions because you have a dihedral angle that's forcing the reflection to be a, a, a fixed unique simplex. But in two dimensions, you know, any ideal triangle is regular. There's no angles to measure. There's nothing to tell you anything about uh, why one of these ideal triangles should go to another. So this tessellation is rigid in dimensions three and higher, but it's completely flabby in dimension two. I mean, there, a, it's a canonical construction, if you like, by reflecting, but, but there's nothing, the fact that any three <coughs> points go to any three points has no meaning whatsoever. And that's true for arbitrary Tobias transformations. So the, the rigidity is all coming from that fact that the, uh, there's a unique, if you specify three, if you know three, points, three points of a, well, in dimension three, if you know three points of a regular ideal tetrahedron, you also know the fourth point. That's not true in no, no, if you if you know the three points, then the fourth point is a parameter. Right? The fourth yeah, point is for the regular. For the regular, it's regular. Unique for the regular. For the regular one, one is unique. Yeah, the dimension is three and up. So, yeah. So you just explain why it wouldn't work in dimension two. I think in dimension three, so this infinity tilde just preserves globally this. this it takes this every regular four tuple to a regular four tuple. Yeah, but it could do it in such a so strange way that there is no real information. It's confusing. No, yeah. you start with, so I start with this tessellation, and uh, the, there's a unique, I mean, it, it take the first simplex goes to something, which is another regular simplex. And that means that the reflections have to go to the reflections, and their reflections have to go to their reflections, so the whole tessellation has to go to the whole tessellation constructed from one. So if I start with one ideal simplex and generate a tessellation, and I map it to another ideal simplex, then I get exactly the same tessellation. But the vertices are dense. So they, they determine the whole map. So uh, am I supposed to stop now? It's not, it's not up to me. <laughs> I mean, I have more lectures. I have a few more slides, um, which I wanted to, I mean, there may be too much to do here. I can do it next time. Uh, so I just maybe skip to the end, and then I can discuss it next time. So uh, the end of the story, which takes a little while to get to, especially with my clicker. Can't do it. too much stuff, but uh, <laughs> here's the end of the story, uh, which I'll do next time. If we take the real numbers that you get by looking at volumes of hyperbolic three manifolds, uh, that other stuff that I skipped tells you that that's actually a well-ordered set of real numbers, which means that if I have some topological property I'm interested in for a hyperbolic three manifold, it's a reasonable thing to do to ask, well, what's the first manifold that has that property? Because they're all nicely ordered as a result of this theorem. So I'll discuss that next time. Questions for the speaker? You could have many manifolds which have that property the same amount. Many manifolds have the same volume, yeah. but only finitely many. So yeah, well, that comes out of this as well. The surgery state, right? They're all obtained by surgery. Yeah, well, we'll do it next time. <laughs> <laughs> Can I change?
change the minus, the plus signs to minus signs first. <laughs> um, I don't know how, how you do that. Three to n. I just take them from you and I put them. You just take my flash drive? I, I have oh. <laughs> Can I change my minus, my plus signs to minus signs? <laughs> Just sure. change and the world. And there were some fours. Threes to ends. Change them all to plus or minus and let people know. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Yeah? Is there a gap since so Well, it's, uh, yeah, the, the, the picture is that you have, well, that's what Elia was saying, you have uh, the volume of a cusp hyperbolic man. And then all the Dane fillings on that are lower volume, but they accumulate. To <coughs> so you have limit points, and you have limit points of limit points. But uh, most places where you look, you'll find gaps. So I mean, there. For example, if you one of the, the statements that, that we'll talk about is if you fix a, a bound, then uh, there's a finite list of manifolds with the property that every manifold whose volume is less than this bound comes from Dane filling of one of these finitely many. And the Dane fillings of a given manifold are discrete except for they accumulate on the, on the cusp. <coughs> Let's thank the speaker again. So I know what you're trying to do.